Hello everybody. We shall start our discussion on special and general theory of relativity today. First of all, we will go through concepts in special theory of relativity. Now I already assume that you have done some special relativity earlier. This is not the first time you were listening to it. And the discussion today and uh, maybe one or two days, one or two lectures to follow will be more on a brief overview of the subject of special theory of relativity, not an extensive display. Let us first start with the principles. The two principles or postulates of the special relativity. The first is just the principle of relativity. And this was there from the time of Galileo. What this all said is that irrespective of the reference system we are in, we should be able to do physics. We should be able to write down physical laws in all reference system. That is also brings in the following that there can be no experiment which can distinguish what is the velocity of the observer who is doing the experiment. That is to say that if such an experiment is done, it does not depend on this velocity or the speed of the observer with respect to any other observer. This is also to say that every point in space and time is equivalent for all observer. What does it mean? It means, let's say that we have a pendulum and I am measuring the amplitude of oscillation of the pendulum. Now obviously, if I go to a certain height on the surface of the earth, the amplitude of oscillation will change. This is just because there is something called gravity which will make it change. But if, if we assume the gravity is same everywhere, that also means that we are not indulged in any accelerated reference system. In that case, wherever I do this experiment with a pendulum, I will always get the same time period for the pendulum. It does not matter who is doing the experiment, where it is done and when it is done. So that is the first principle, the first postulate of the special relativity. The second postulate is the universality of the speed of light. This is something which actually contributed, was contributed by Einstein. Two observers Even they have a non-zero relative velocity between them, will measure the same speed for light ray travel. For light rays say. Not only that, this is also true for, for all emitting or for all emitters, emitters of light rays moving with
arbitrary velocity with them. It's a very strong postulate. It is telling you it doesn't matter what is the relative velocity of two observers. They are measuring the speed of light probably from two different sources. These sources are moving with any arbitrary velocity with these observers. Whatever the, they measure as the speed of the light will always, they will, their measurements will always agree. So these are the two postulates which were based on, which are mostly based on observations and enormous insight by Einstein for the second postulate. which constituted the special theory of relativity. The first postulate is called postulate, but it is also our drive of doing physics because we essentially want, without, if there is no potential or anything else, just space and time itself should be same everywhere. They, they should not have any effect where you are in the space and time. Otherwise, what will happen? is that whenever you move through space and time, you should then need to evoke new laws of physics. And if you want to do that, then there is no point of having a law of physics. The fact that we want an universal laws for physics, physical phenomena, requires the first postulate. Second postulate is Einstein's insight to explain certain observations, which I guess you are already aware of, so I will not go through them again. Before we proceed further with these two postulates, we should first define what are so-called inertial observers. So let's do that now. Many often the special relativity is taught in the perspective of what we call the Lorentz transformation. We'll see as we go along that Lorentz transformation actually plays minimal role in understanding special relativity or anything else actually. It is not that Lorentz transformation is not required to be known, it is required to be known but the special relativity has a lot more flavor than Lorentz transformation. In fact, we will not even discuss Lorentz transformation much in our initial discussions on this special relativity. We'll start by asking the question, how an observation is done? How we define a reference frame? And in the special relativity, the type of reference frame we talk about are called the inertial reference frames. And the observers we talk about are called the inertial observers. So what are inertial observers? This is a class of observer, not one, but many of observers. Who have constant relative velocities maintained at all time that is to say if any time i calculate or somehow you measure the relative velocity of all these observers if there are n observers you get n combination two relative velocities and once you know that you know the relative velocity belong amongst these observers for all time because they doesn't change. Okay, at least it is true for the process of observation, but we will consider this happens for the whole time. Now these are inertial observers. How do I define an inertial reference frame?
there is actually a way of defining an inertial reference frame using only one observer. But at least now, we will not consider that approach because it requires us to know a little bit more in the field. For the time being, we will consider an inertial reference frame being re defined by many observers. Actually, one observer at every point in the space. So this is very important because the fact that you don't understand that there actually requires many observers unless you do very tricky things to define an inertial reference frame, many of the paradoxes in special relativity appears. So who are these observers? These are class of the inertial observers. So it's a subclass of the previous class. By class, I mean just group. These observers have the following property that they have zero relative velocities. So their relative velocity is not only constant, but it is zero. They are all at different positions. Spatial positions. Each of them have a good clock. I'll define what is good. The clocks are all synchronized. This is not a very straightforward statement. So I request you to think about it. Synchronize means they tick zero. When they tick zero in one clock, it ticks zero in all the other clocks. And then the clocks also run in the same rate. Okay, so when I defined, when you defined inertial observers, we said there are observers who are, their relative velocity is always constant, it doesn't change with time. So there can be, say, two observers, if I pick two of these inertial observers, their relative velocity may be 5 km per second, say. But that 5 km per second stays as 5 km per second. There may be 10,000 people moving with relative velocity of 5 km per second with respect to one observer. Now I pick up these 10,000 people, all of them are moving with a relative velocity 5 km per second with respect to our first observer. Means this 10,000 people, their relative velocity, their relative velocity amongst themselves is all zero. So first I choose these observers. Then I place them at all different positions in X. There's no harm if you put two observers at the same position, but why do you pay twice for the same job? Then you give each of them a clock, which is a good clock, which means that their clocks are all synchronized and they, they tick at the same rate. It is not guaranteed that always you will be able to give clocks to arbitrary observers and synchronize them. We'll discuss this point later in the course, but if we are talking about inertial observers, it is always possible to synchronize the clocks. 
I also put in another point here and I put in in a different color because we maybe will not be able to understand this at this point but this will be important later. Geometry of the space in which the reference frame is different defined is Euclidean. So this essentially means, mathematically it means that all the axioms of Euclid that you have learned in your school holds here. Okay, This is what it means but there is what is, what if they does not hold, what do you call them? That you will discuss in detail later. But just keep this in mind. The other question is that how do I make sure that the all clocks run at the same rate? Well, I give you a clock which follows some atomic or subatomic phenomena. If I take that clock to different places, and remember that when I am pl placing it at different places, these different places should not be such that these clocks are feeling any force at this point of time because if it feels a force, it will have an acceleration and if it has an acceleration, it will not remain an inertial observer. So that observer who has this clock goes somewhere, his motion is still constant of zero velocity with respect to all his other frames constituting the reference frame. And now the first postulate tells you any physical phenomena happening at that place doesn't depend on where you are. So if the physical phenomena is an atomic transition, it will always have the same rate for the transition. And if that is true, then your clock will run at the same rate because it depends maybe on that atomic transition. So this is how I define an inertial reference frame. For every point in this reference frame, every spatial point, there is one observer, he knows his position and he has a clock, can measure anything happening there. Let's proceed. The next concept we will come up on is called an event. Event is something that happens. So when I say something that happens, it happens at a special position and also at a time. So where it happens and when it happens. To specify this, how will it be specified? This is what each observer measures. So each observer, one event happens at a given point in space, which means it happens at one observer. So to specify each event, each observer gives the following numbers. The time when the event happens and say let us call Cartesian coordinates x, y and z. These numbers. So 
associated with the event are the coordinates the coordinates of an event i will write these as ct x y z as opposed to t x y z just because if i write it this way all of the four numbers these are the numbers that the observer is telling you about that event they have same dimension this can also be noted with a different notation which we call an index notation where i write ct as x0 so this 0 is a subscript 0 it is not to the power 0 this has x1 this has x2 this has x3 okay and similarly i can write a shorthand for the index notation now instead of writing it four times i can just write x alpha where it is understood that alpha belongs to 0 1 2 and 3 so you see alpha equals to 0 corresponds to the time coordinate and 1 2 3 corresponds to the spatial coordinates sometimes we will like to distinguish between the time and the spatial coordinates for that what one does is that if i am using greek alphabets then that goes from 0 1 2 3 on the other hand if i only want to use the spatial parts so then i will use roman alphabets Greek alphabet example is say alpha, Roman alphabet example is say L. So that will go from 1 to 3. So this is how I mathematically represent an event. If now this is this event or if I have many events, they can be measured by one set of inertial observers. So let us ask about a particular type or series of events and this series of events are the events on the trajectory of a particle. Okay, so I am talking about all the events which are happening on the trajectory of a particle. So this is a collection of events. Imagine that this particle is posed by an observer. So that observer is moving around and then he has the clock and all these events as it happens, he records the time of the clock. What will happen now? Now, for this observer, the observer is never moving. So, for all this observer, all the events that he records happens at his position and he can as well call that position spatially zero. So, all these events, he can level all these events. All these events. just by the time at which they happens. 
because they all happen at the same position, position of the observer. Okay, so this level of time, which is measured, this time, this time measured in the reference frame when I say reference frame now it is an inertial reference frame of the particle this I call tau or it has a name it's called proper time We'll see why it is called proper time at the end of today. So what we understood? I understood that if there is an observer associated with that particle whose motion we are interested in and he's measuring the clicks of his clock and all the clock as all the events are happening, then he can just write down the time of the events for all the spatial positions he will record his own spatial position which he can as well call zero what about a different set of observer a different set of observer And when I say this, I don't talk about anything about the type of the velocity this particle can have with respect to this different set of observer. The particle can actually accelerate, it doesn't matter because we are not asking the question how the physics will look between these two. We are just trying to assign coordinates. So let's say that a different set of observer looks at the same events these events now because the particle is moving with respect to them the particle is moving with respect to them Because the particle is moving with respect to them, they will see these all the events that was recorded by the observer in the trajectory of the particle, they happen at different places now and they happen at different times. All the events would now happen. at different place and different time they are still hap they are happening at different time earlier also but now they will also happen at different place because the particle is moving with respect to these observers so say they record x or should I start with ct so they record let me write this way x0 x1 x2 x3 for one event they record these numbers but as they follow the trajectory of the particle all the events that the previous observer has recorded will they these people will also record the same events and those events earlier was leveled by tau so the first event say tau equals to tau 1, second event say tau equals to tau 2. What we are arriving at is that now I can see that all these will be function of tau.
So events in the trajectory are leveled by tau, the proper time. So the proper time, if I tell you, you can tell me where in the trajectory the particle is now as seen by these observers. So x0 actually is a function of tau, a different tau, x0 has different values. And x0 which is c times t is also a measure of time because this now depends on which reference frame you are. So it depends on the reference frame or the coordinate system associated with this reference frame, this is called coordinate time. If now, so this is one set of inertial observers, I can now go to another set of inertial observer. Let's say yet another set of inertial observers. So there are many set of inertial observers keeping track of this particle. Surprisingly, the particle must be very important. Looks at the same events again. Now, what will they record? With respect to them, the particle positions may have been different at different proper time. So they may record something different. So which I denote by prime. At the same proper times, they record different numbers. Okay. So you see, one thing which is coming out from our discussion is the following, that if I have an event, this event can be given in one reference frame and let us use the notation that we have, shorthand notation that we have introduced in terms of x0, x1, x2, x3, so I write x alpha. This is from reference frame A. I'm sorry. The all point is that the reference frame A will come here. So the coordinates depends on the reference frame. The same event can be written in terms of x alpha prime from reference frame B. Same event. The coordinates are different. These events must be at the same tau. So should I put in that, it would look like same tau. Which means because they are Denoting the same events, these two should be related. And one need to know this relation and the properties of how these are related such that once you write down now the trajectory of the particle in terms of x alpha say you should be able to figure out what it will look like from any other coordinate system okay so now let us define with every inertial reference frame a coordinate system
so what is this this is all time and position recorded by inertial observers recorded in an inertial reference frame you see in an inertial reference frame i have values of numerous values of x0 x1 x2 x3 so we make a configuration space out of it this is the coordinate system associated with the particular set of inertial observers these observers will be able to trace a curve How are the curves defined? See, curves are defined as x alpha as a function of some parameter, and in this curve, if it is the trajectory of a particle, is a function of that parameter called proper time. All possible trajectories or trace curves for all possible trajectories. in their coordinate system. So these curves are called word lines. Configuration space trajectory of a particle. Okay. Now you see this word line will look different if I am dealing with two different configuration space because x alpha as a function of tau is different for each configuration space. So before we look at the differences, we should see what is that which doesn't change if we go to different configuration spaces. So let's ask that question. What remains, the word doesn't change mathematically is called invariant. So what remains invariant? If we change coordinates or change from one inertial frame frame to other, as you may guess, I happen to know the answer. And because of that, I'll start with the answer and then I will show you that it remains invariant. The quantity we'll define is called interval. It also, it is a measure of space-time distance and we'll see why how do i define this say i have events e1 and e2 so let's define it for one inertial reference frame first so if i have event say e1 which is given by the coordinates x alpha 1 and I have events e2 which is given by x alpha 2 
and we are trying to define an infinitesimal interval so we say that x alpha 2 is nothing but x alpha 1 and then a small change delta x alpha so this is my this is these are the two events now the definition of the interval this is something very important for us we write it usually delta s square it is not delta s whole square or delta of s square the entire thing delta s square should be considered as one thing which i can also write as for this infinitesimal case this is true for all cases but in infinitesimal case it is more good looking We can use a shorthand notation for this. You can see that I can write this again shorthand. Delta S square is summation over alpha from 0 to 3 beta also from 0 to 3 and then I introduce this quantity g alpha beta it has two indices which essentially means alpha can vary from 0 to 3 beta can vary from 0 to 3 so there are in principle 16 values of g alpha beta and you can see just if I compare the previous line with the previous line, we can find out what is our g alpha beta. g alpha beta is 0 if alpha not equals to beta and equals to 1 if alpha equals beta equals 0, which is the coefficient for delta x 0 square, which is 1. And this is equals to minus 1 if alpha equals to beta equals. Let me write L and you know that L can run from 1 to 3. So if alpha and beta both are 1 or both are 2 or both are 3, then G alpha beta is minus 1. If you put this back into the expression for G alpha beta, you will see that you will get this. This is also sometimes written as now the interval can be defined the other way also where I write the time part negative and the spatial part positive. Both the definitions are used in the literature. We will use this one. Now as you can see here, some of the indices I have written downstairs, some of the indices I have written upstairs. Again, there are reasons for that, but we should not bother about it at this point of time. It will be clear when we discuss why we write something downstairs, something upstairs. Now, we will discuss, we will introduce something more here, which is the summation convention by Einstein. This is again another shorthand notation this time it is used if i have a summation so if i have a summation more often or not you will see that one index comes either downstairs here upstairs here or sometimes upstairs in one and downstairs in the other so if such thing happens that always i see that with the summation there is one index down one index up then I don't need to write the summation that big sigma things. We can just write this as g alpha beta delta x alpha delta x beta. Back of our mind, we have the fact that well, alpha can go from 0, 1, 2, th and 3. And I have one alpha downstairs, one alpha upstairs. So I should sum over alpha when I write this. So this equivalently means this. But the sum over alpha equals 0 to 3 is not written. 
similarly for beta. So this is called Einstein's summation convention. And this is uh, very widely used in terms of in, in uh, special and general relativity and many other places. Now, let us ask the question that how will this look like if I want to write the interval in a different coordinate system. Now, by definition, if I am writing in a different coordinate system, the interval by definition can be written in terms of the x0, x1, x2, x3 prime which is which are the values measured in this coordinate system I should be able to do that which is nothing but in this particular case I can use the shorthand notation I can say that this is equals g alpha beta delta x alpha prime delta x beta prime. Now you see the coordinate transformations we are talking about are infinitesimal transformations. I can always build up a big transformation where things change drastically by doing many small infinitesimal transformations. So let us look at for infinitesimal transformation first. If the transformation is infinitesimal, first of all, what do I mean by a transformation? I mean that x0 prime if the transformation is uh, okay sorry I mean that x0 prime is related to so there is a function which relates x0 prime so I will write on the one so let's let us put the zero so there is a function f0 which relates x0 prime with the measured value in the other coordinate system. You see, if I really want to use the shorthand notation, I can write the same thing as x prime beta is related as x prime beta x alpha. This x prime beta is a function. If it is a linear transformation, if it is an infinitesimal transformation, sorry, then I can show that this will be a linear combination of x0, x1, x2 and x3. Like there will be a coefficient with respect to this there will be a coefficient with respect to this, there will be a coefficient with respect to this, so on. And not only this, I have to write down all of the x primes, so I can write as well call this beta prime. Okay, so beta can go from 0, 1, 2, 3, so I have 4 into 4 such objects. Now because the transformation is infinitesimal, these objects, 16 of them, they are very small. And I can neglect their second order compared to their first order or their third order compared to their second order, etc. Which means now, if I have this delta s square, 
delta s prime square, I can write them using these transformation rules in terms of delta x alpha and delta x beta. But obviously, there will be 16 numbers which will sit in front of them. And these 16 numbers will be the combinations of this a0, a1, a2, a3, etc. Had it been a not small transformation and linear relations like this, I would have required not only delta x square here, but delta x cube to the power 4, etc. terms. That is not required because this is just a linear and infinitesimal transformation. Okay. So now, if I can figure out the properties of m alpha beta, then I can figure out the relation between delta s square in one reference frame and delta s prime square in other reference frame. So let us say properties of m alpha beta. What is m alpha beta coming? Where is m alpha beta coming from? It is coming from the transformation. Infinitesimal transformation. From one reference, from one inertial reference frame, What is the quantity that defines such a transformation? Well, the velocity. The transformation cannot be defined by a, po a position or a time because if I do that, then the first postulate will be violated. It can be defined by the relative velocity. So, defined by the relative velocity. between the inertial frames and there can be one on only one relative velocity between two inertial frames because they are inertial. But you see the velocity is a vector. It has also directional dependence. If the transformation depends on that directional dependence, then there is a problem because then we should be able to pick if I am standing in free space, completely empty universe, I should be able to tell you which direction is my x direction. But that is you. That is meaningless, right? We cannot be able to tell which direction is x if, say, our eyes are closed. So this should not only depend on the relative velocity, it should depend on the magnitude of the relative velocity. Which means, m alpha beta is only a function of the real magnitude of the relative velocity which I call v. And again there can be four values of alpha and for each values of alpha there can be four values of beta. So there are in principle 16 components. If we know all 16 of them we should 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 know how the ds prime square transform. Further, we observe that when we write ds prime square, I have terms like say m01 dx0. Uh, not d, but delta x0, delta x1. I also have term like m10, delta x1, delta x0. I have many other terms. I am just writing these two to demonstrate this. And these two, you see that I have m01 plus m10 which I can take common because these two delta x0 delta x1 is same as delta x1 delta x0 and I have many such terms. So every term if alpha is not equals to beta 
then it is clear that and even if alpha is equals to beta m alpha beta has to be equals to m beta alpha if it is not so what i can do is i can just change the m's i can write m10 here and m01 there and add them but i will get the same value so there is no point of distinguishing between them so that reduces from 16 components here this tells me that there are 10 independent components four diagonal and six off diagonal now we consider two events on the path of a light ray you see i can consider any arbitrary two events if this m alpha beta are derived from the infinitesimal change from one reference frame to the other the transformation rules for any arbitrary events in one reference frame they will transfer the exact same way to all i mean for any arbitrary coordinate systems of an event in a given reference frame will transfer the exact same way as any other event, coordinate system of any other events so i can just choose my events and see try to seek for the properties of m so let's calculate delta s square for this this is delta x0 square minus delta r square where i write delta r square for the spatial separation which is delta x1 square plus delta x2 square plus delta x3 square and remember delta x0 square is c square dt square so if I forcefully take this common, what I am left with is 1 minus delta r by let us write this as c delta t square of that. And you will agree that speed of the light is c and delta r by delta t because these two events happen at the trajectory of the light e is speed of the light this is this which tells us that delta s square for light rays is zero if you do the same exercise in the other reference frame, you'll still find zero because it's still light rays, it still is velocity is c. There's the second postulate. What does it give us? It tells us then that delta s prime square I can write as the zero zero component of m which I should multiply by uh, delta x naught square but you see this also tells me that delta x naught square for the light is same as delta r square because then only if I subtract them I will guess delta s square equals to 0 this is the corollary of this exercise so I can write this as delta r square
then I have terms where one of the indices of m is 0 and the other is i but it will come like m0 i once and m i0 once as we have seen before so I just put that 2 to incorporate both of them and then I have delta xi delta r because delta x0 is same as delta r and I will have terms with all special special components and there will be nine of them which I all write here and remember this is zero now this is true for any arbitrary delta xi so what I do is all the special component I have let's write the same with all delta xi change to minus of delta xi okay it should be true for that also because this is true for all light rays and if i do that let's see what will happen the first term will remain as it is the second term will pick up a minus sign because i have only delta xi once here so that will become minus so this will pick up a minus sign the third term will not change because all the special component i will change and it will change twice here minus times minus is obviously positive what does it mean now it implies that if both of these are true I can subtract one from the other and what I will be left with is the m00 delta r square will go away as I subtract mij delta xi delta xj will go away so I will be left with the fact that m0i delta xi delta r should be 0 for arbitrary for any position delta xi positional change so this implies that m0i are 0 so there goes three more components so i i was having 10 independent components now i have seven independent components m alpha beta has seven independent components at this stage okay so if this is zero then if i look at this expression again the term disappears so what i am left with is m zero zero delta r square plus m i j delta x i delta x j equals 0 now let's open it and write it up this thing i am writing in long hand first of all delta r square means delta x 1 square which is multiplied by m00 here so i have delta x1 square multiplied by m00 but here also i and j can be 1 so i have this plus m when i and j equals to 1 which i can write once as m11 for delta x1 so this is the coefficient of delta x1 square plus I have delta x2 square into m00 plus m22 
these are the terms where i equals to j but then i have again two times the terms where i have i not equals to j so m12 delta x1 delta x2 and two other terms which i am not writing and this is all equals to zero now you see again should be true above which is this should be true for arbitrary delta xi right so which means that what i can do is i can say okay my delta x2 is 0 delta x3 is 0 this should be true for all delta x1 and that will essentially tell you that m00 is minus m11 because delta x2 0 this goes to 0 two of these terms goes to 0 delta x3 0 this goes to 0 and then only thing left is the first term where i said that should be true for arbitrary delta x1 so m00 is minus m1 similarly you can show that m00 is also minus m2 2 and minus m33 and all mij for i not equals to j are 0 which essentially means this entire m alpha beta which is a function of v now remind you is diagonal 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 times m 0 0 let's see if we can understand this so all the off diagonals are 0 off diagonal means when alpha is not equals to beta if alpha equals to beta then m 0 0 is m 0 0 that we don't know still what it is but m 1 1 m 2 2 m 3 3 are minus m 0 0 so this brings it down to one independent component okay so let's see what has happened so i had delta s square equals if you remember m alpha beta which are 16 functions of v times delta x alpha delta x beta now m alpha beta has become m 0 0 1 function of v into a matrix which is a diagonal matrix 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and then delta x alpha delta x beta what did we call this diagonal matrix earlier you see this is the diagonal matrix which we call g alpha beta so this delta s square is then m 0 0 v g alpha beta delta x alpha delta x beta but what is this this is telling you this is s prime by the way this is now 1 m 0 0 v away from delta s prime square uh -huh, delta s square no prime here so now if i know what is m 0 0 v i would be able to figure out what is the relation between delta s prime and delta s now to do that let us do a thought experiment thought experiments are at the crack of Einstein's reasoning so let's do that here to figure out what is m00 as a function of v so what we do is we consider three reference frames the reference frames are say a b and c 
two events are seen from all three reference frames. So I can calculate delta S square A here. I can calculate delta S square B here. I can calculate delta S square C here. The relative velocity between the reference frames are like VAB, VBC. And if I consider from A to C, that will be VAC. Okay, so let's now use this to write down delta S square B in terms of delta S square A. Well, you know how to do it. It will be M00 and VAB. M00 will be function of VAB. Similarly, I can write delta S square C in terms of again delta S square A and this time the M00 function will be function of AC. I can also write delta S square C in terms of delta S square B and that will be a function of V, B, C. Right? All these three should be true given whatever you have seen so far. But you see, we also can use, uh, say for example, these two divide one by other to eliminate delta S squared A. So what I can write is delta S squared B by delta S squared C is just the ratio of the two M zeros. Because uh, let's not take intervals in the light rays path such that delta S squared cancels out. Otherwise, I get this. But this is also same as 1 by from the third of the relations. Which tells me, this essentially is telling me that M00. So let's call, let's take a shorter notation because we're writing a lot of things here. So this, let us write this as MAB. Okay. So I then have MAB, which is this, times this, which is MBC equals M. This should be SC. I've done a mistake here. Should be SC. Right? But you see, we're talking about a relation. M is a function of V. So for any V, it should be true. So what I do is, again, I do a trick that we consider all v's are same. Their directions can be different, but the magnitudes, all these three magnitudes are same. There's no harm in doing that. At least for this also, this equation should hold. And what this equation becomes then? It becomes m square minus m. By the way, these are m zero zeros. This is equal zero. With two solutions, 1 is m00 equals 1, other is m00 equals 0. Okay, m00 equals 0 is a very boring solution. Then I can go to any reference frame and make it, make that interval 0. So this is the solution to take. Which means the interval
delta S square equals G alpha beta is invariant. And that is a very, very important notion uh, in spatial and even in general relativity. In fact, this is what you get from the two postulates and everything else comes out of this, including the Lorentz transformation. I'll stop here and we'll continue from here in the next day.